Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just an initial welcome to, to all those that are currently joining. Uh, we see a lot of people uh, jumping into the session. Um, so we'll just give it a few more seconds, uh, 30 seconds or so, and then we will get started with the session. Uh, but for those that are you that are currently on, thank you for joining. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this, the seventh in a series of, um, of webinars. Uh, we haven't had one for a while. I think the last one was in June, um, and uh, this is the, the follow-up to that. Um, so welcome to the session. Uh, we're certainly looking forward to uh, hosting you on this session and uh, getting into a discussion which is very dear to the heart of everyone in the PESA and to the panel members that are that are joining us today. And that is around skills and then specific to digital skills, uh, the development of it, the um, and, and just understanding uh, the nature of uh, the situation that we face currently in our country. Um, the agenda that we're going to address is going to be an introduction to the um, to PEPESA and to focus on, you know, what does PEPESA do? That's going to be very brief and not too, not too much detail there because we'd like to keep as much time as possible for uh, the discussions that we've got. Uh, I just want to remove that. And then um, we'll do an introduction to the panel members that, that will be joining us today. Um, questions, please. Uh, Post your questions in the um, in the chat box, and uh, we'll be looking at those and monitoring those, and then we'll uh, we'll respond to those at the end of the panel discussion. Um, and if there's enough time left at the end, um, I'll wrap up with a discussion on uh, some more BEPESA and um, uh, just focusing on the member value uh, of being a member of the PESA. And then we'll end off. And uh, this session is going to be a one hour session. And uh, we have quite a few topics to address. So we hope that we can address all of them. If we don't, then obviously that, that will be for a discussion next time. But uh, certainly look forward to uh, the session with the panel members and with you as guests on the call. Um, moving on to uh, BEPESA. Uh, BEPESA is the recognized industry body for the global business services sector. Uh, we provide a service to the sector in, in various uh, forms. Um, in a nutshell, we provide our members and our stakeholders the insights and the support to succeed in this industry. We, ad we address both supply side that is the development of skills, the um, promoting of, um, of the sector to um, young people that want to enter into the sector. And then on the other side, we look at the demand side. Uh, most importantly, assisting our uh, operator partners and uh, the companies that are delivering on services and, um, and looking at the development of demand, both locally as well as internationally. And so that, in a nutshell, is, is uh, what PEPESA does. And um, I think in this last time, if we look back, PEPESA has been instrumental in making sure that the GBS sector was one of the few sectors in the country that actually showed uh, rapid growth through the uh, lockdown period, as well as the period following the lockdown. And also, we were also uh, successful in ensuring that the sector remained open uh, through that period of time by lobbying with government and various stakeholders uh, to ensure that the sector remained healthy, remained operational. And uh, this gave our international uh, customers 
um, a lot of um, assurance that South Africa was a safe place to move their business to. Um, and as a result, uh, we saw significant growth in the sector. So, um, so Bapesa really playing a very important role in um, supporting and then building uh, the GBS sector in the country. If we look at this series of webinars, then uh, this is a question that uh, we posed uh, about just, uh, just under 12 months ago. And the question that we, we put out there was, can South Africa attain the status of a leader in the delivery of IT outsourcing and digital services? Um, as, as a country that delivers very strongly in the BPO industry, uh, that has been established. Uh, South Africa has been recognized as the number one uh, destination for international customers that want to outsource their BPO processes and their uh, customer experience processes to South Africa. The question we're trying to answer here is, um, can South Africa, and then also what does South Africa need to do in order to uh, reach that status? Um, in IT outsourcing, as well as in um, digital services. So with that, um, we're going to move directly into the discussion for today. Um, the discussion today really um, is going to be focused on a recent skills survey report that was released by uh, the JCSE, um, the Janusburg Center for Software Engineering, as well as the IITPSA, which is the professional um, body for uh, professional services in South Africa. And this um, skills survey is available. We will also make it available to you. Um, and um, joining me on the panel today are gonna be the co-authors of this report. And um, our panel members today is Professor Barry Goletsky, um, and um, Adrian Schofield. Um, now, Professor Barry has been, he's got a long list of, uh, uh, of um, things that he's been involved in and roles that he's been playing in. And um, I'm going to mention but a few. So, uh, Prof. Barry has been uh, Emeritus Professor. He's been with uh, VITS for over 32 years. And um, has been uh, a professor in the software engineering department at WITS um, from 1989 through to December 2017. Um, in addition to that, uh, he's recently been appointed director of innovation strategy at WITS and um, was instrumental in launching the Chamala Hong uh, precinct in Bromfontein, where he currently serves as the Chief Visionary Officer, and then um, launched the Johannesburg Center for Software Engineering in 20, 2007, uh, where he currently is the Director and CEO of the JS, JCSE. So welcome, Prof. Barry. Uh, I look forward to spending this time with you and to uh, getting you know, you to share your thoughts and your experience in, in this area. Um, and I know recently in the last three years, you've been spending a lot of time as a speaker, as a consultant, and um, you've got a very interesting uh, podcast that you've launched. Um, and uh, I would urge uh, those of you that are listening on, uh, on the on the webinar to go and look for that podcast because um, it is extremely interesting, especially if you're interested in um, the history of technology in South Africa. So welcome, Prof. Barry. Then um, Adrian Schofield joins us uh, from the IIT PSA, where uh, Adrian has been um, a program and production consultant. Um, I think your time there, uh, Adrian, comes to an end at the end of this month, and I'm sure that you're going to be moving on to uh, uh, many more exciting uh, things going forward. I know that you're going to be involved in some projects uh, with Professor. 
Um, but you've also been the vice chair uh, for the last seven years of the International Professional Practice Partnership, the IP3, um, at, and then also a counselor and acting CEO of the Triple BEE ICT Sector Council, uh, which you serve part time. I mean, I, I did try to make uh, sense out of your LinkedIn, which has got a huge list of things that you've been involved in. Uh, so absolutely, uh, you've been um, very active in the industry and a huge source of uh, experience in the space of skills and uh, job profiling. So welcome to both you, Adrian and Prof. Barry. I'm going to just uh, cut these slides and stop sharing so that uh, we can just get into some discussions. And then as we go through the discussions, I am going to uh, put up the actual report that uh, we are referring to um, so that we can look at some of the detail into that report. So with that, I want to just uh, give you each an opportunity to just do uh, an introduction uh, from yourselves. So with that, Barry, uh, Prof. Barry, I'll just hand over to you and you can just do a brief introduction. Thank you so much, Neville, and um, hi to everyone. I've been glancing at the names and I see a lot of friends out there. So hello, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be on this podcast. And as people who know me will know, I'm super, super interested in skills in the digital economy and how we position South Africa to be a, a global player. So I'm completely behind the Bapesa mission to try and um, kind of see how we can become leaders in this. And I think at the heart of it all is skills, hence the, um, my passion behind the um, survey of skills we do regularly with our partners, ITPSA. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks, Prof. Barry. Adrian, would you like to do an introduction, please? Uh, thanks, Neville, um, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, as you said, I've, I've got a long uh, and, and complicated uh, list of, of activities that I've been involved in, um, but I think per pertinent to today's discussion is the fact that um, I spent uh, 10 years with Prof Barry at the JCSE um, doing uh, research uh, around the uh, the skills issues in the ICT sector, and the last uh, almost four years uh, as a consultant at IIT PSA. And during that time, I've been the author or co-author of all 11 editions of the JCSE IIT PSA skills survey report. Um, so hopefully uh, what, what um, we've said in that report um, strikes a chord. Um, we, always um, find out that um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I, I expect that in our uh, discussion today, um, some of that will, will come out in um, specific areas of interest. Um, so I look forward to, to joining with you now. Oh, thank you, Adrian. So let me start the ball rolling by um, just taking us back um, what is it? It's almost two years now to that moment in um, 2020, early last year. So it's not two years, but it's uh, last year we um, got the news or we went into this uh, COVID situation and suddenly everything changed. Um, we all had to adapt very quickly and uh, South Africa had adapted very early on. Um, by going into lockdown, uh, Bapesa at that time had to respond uh, directly with the, ensuring that the industry remained open. But for, I know that in your report, you, 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 you speak about this and it comes out in the report quite actively, is, um, is the impact that that lockdown had on, on work in South Africa and specifically work from home in South Africa. Um, but what I want to ask, and maybe I'll start off with you, uh, Prof. Perry, is 
What are the, the what is the outflow or the impact that the work from home had on skills and on skills development generally, and just then also the um, the the impact that it had on business. So and um, it's um, something that a lot of us have thought a lot about, and um, I think that the first knee jerk that we that most of us have is that we talked for many years about digital transformation, work from home, digitalization of the workplace. And it always seemed something distant and something that would hardly ever happen or might happen over a long period. And then almost like a magic wand, everything changed. And within a few days, we were all doing this digital stuff. And I think a lot of us in the digital community have patted ourselves on the back and said, aren't we wonderful? We've um, digital transformation happened overnight and we were ready for it. And I think that um, it is something that we should look at our colleagues in this industry and really give them a big shout out for for making this happen. The people who have kept the networks connected, who have grown this connectivity, who have uh, done all this amazing stuff and kept our economy running on the back of digital technology. But the one word that, I, that I've been troubled over is digital transformation. And have we digitally transformed or have we digitalized? And I think for me, digital transformation means huge change. It means things are different. And I've, I've been looking at companies and organizations and as they've gone digital, have they just taken their old way of working and supported it digitally or have they indeed digitally transformed? And I think the jury is still out, but I suspect we've seen more digital um, adoption and less digital transformation. So there's still a lot to do. We still have to really look at how we embrace digital to change how we do things. And that still has, still has to happen. In terms of skills, it was amazing that we didn't need to go and invest in huge amounts of new technology and train thousands of people. People picked up the tools that they already knew and had and just managed to be digital. So it's really um, quite an interesting thing that the skills were there and they are legacy skills. We, hadn't, we didn't have to send gazillions of people on training courses to do the stuff. So that's been interesting to me. Very, that is interesting, and we'll, we'll talk more around this, um, Prof. Barry. But Adrian, what were your experience and your insights, especially looking at some of the data that came out of the report? I think the um, issue for us was we expected that there would be a much greater impact on the um, skills gap because of the, the shift in the uh, working environment uh, then came out in, in the survey. Um, and bearing in mind, we conducted our research in the sort of um, middle of, of 2021, when there had been certainly more than a year's experience of life under the, uh, the restrictions of, of lockdown. Um, it, as, as Barry says, it was a tribute really to the um, adaptability of, of the sector and the people using technology in other sectors, that um, the, the transition to uh, remote working was, was accomplished with relatively little impact on the, the skills demand um, that, that had existed um, prior to that. Yeah, certainly, um, certainly very interesting. Uh, um, one of the areas that you, you raised in the report 
um, was the, the spotlight that had been shed on connectivity and the fact that um, the divide between you know, the haves and the have-nots uh, had suddenly been exposed in terms of sending people home and then realizing that um, maybe they didn't have the, the bandwidth that uh, was required in order for them to work from home. And I think there was a there was a response to that in trying to get you know the the necessary um, network uh, connectivity sorted out. But um, you spoke about this in the report as well. So, Adrian, your thoughts on that? The um, issue wasn't so much one of of skills either in the the hands of the, the users or, in fact, of the, the technicians supporting uh, the, the connectivity, the networks. Um, it, it mostly became a, a question of um, bandwidth availability and reliability of connection, um, added to which were the employers of the remote workers um, able to uh, fund the requirements of those workers in terms of connectivity. Um, you know, were they able to provide um, modems and, and uh, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity in their home environments? Uh, were the um, signal strengths um, suitable in, in those domestic locations as opposed to in, in the work environments? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's why we didn't see a great change in, in the skills gap around those particular um, issues. But there was obviously a lot of, of industry focus on uh, how good were the connections. And, and there were obviously lots of um, uh, jocular comments about uh, how we expressed ourselves in, you know, can you hear me? Can you see me? Am I connected? All of those sort of issues that, um, are now fading away from, from these sort of Zoom discussions. Yes. Okay, now that's great. I mean, um, I want to move across to um, looking more at the, at the requirement for skills development. Um, so when we look at, uh, when we step back and we look at the, how digital has now proliferated, and I think you mentioned that, uh, of Barry, that there's this realization that we need to, um, adopt digital and maybe the transformation is something that uh, will take time but what it does mean is that in any industry whether it's in uh, the ICT industry or any other industry for that matter uh, there is a requirement for uh, digital uh, learning to take place um, and I know in the report uh, there's a reference to uh, coding from an early age. Um, what is your thoughts on that? And I know you had a, you had you had something to say around you know core versus the other skills that actually are are as important, if not more important. Yeah, and um, so this is this is not so much to do with lockdown and post COVID, but. It's the, it's the sort of narrative we've had for the last few years around the so-called fourth industrial revolution. And when the world woke up to Klaus Schwab's uh, call to everyone to get ready for the fourth industrial revolution, there was a huge um, wave of, of energy that went around people getting ready for this so-called fourth industrial revolution. And one of the things that people started to say is that, that everyone from grade R to beyond should know how to code and know how to do robotics. So in certain parts of the world, and I think in some schools in South Africa, you have very little kids that are learning coding, that are learning robotics and um, it's, it's kind of been said that this, is, this will be the language of the fourth industrial revolution, will be coding. And I challenge that a bit. I think that the world is broken up into those that are going to use digital technology and those that are going to create the, the underpinning 
technology and applications. And I think those who create the applications and the technology are a small proportion, very important proportion, but a small, small proportion. Those that use it is everyone. And I think that the users really don't need to learn coding. Uh, you know, you don't need to understand how your uh, TV remote works to flick through channels. Uh, the person who builds the next remote has to understand how the, the technology works that, that uh, drives it. So I think that we, we've, we, we've maybe gone a bit overboard in terms of, of digital skills. Our, um, and what, we sh what our survey focuses on is that other group, the group of professionals, the group of practitioners. And I think within that group, the earlier people learn to code, the better, and the, the, the more familiar they get with computers and what they can do. But I think that, and um, I've, I've actually written a piece in the report where I say that the core skills that people need are, yes, we, we kind of need the, the basic understanding of science and maths and STEM and yes, maybe coding and robotics, but much more important than that, we need people to have some, some softer skills, the skill to learn how to learn. In this world, anyone in the digital world is gonna always be on a learning curve. We need people to, um, to, 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 um, to, to learn how to communicate because um, IT, digital work is a team sport. People do it together and you have to communicate. And then a, a, a somewhat surprising thing, but I really believe in it, is people must know how to sell because you always are selling yourself and um, selling your ideas and you need the skill to do that. So those are core skills that people need. And I believe that that's what you acquire in a, in a good quality tertiary education environment. So I think people should aspire to go to university, should aspire to get as qualified as they can. But I, I kind of used to say, everyone must do engineering or computer science. I've sort of changed my mind. I think go out and get any qualification you can, because in getting a good BA, BCom, law degree, anything, you'll learn that those skills of how to learn, how to communicate and how to sell and then the core skills you pick up in various ways. So that's really how I see the, the skills and the skills pyramid. Oh, that's, uh, that's some great, and, I, and I, as I was reading through the report that really resonated with me in terms of, um, you know, if you certainly look at the communication skills, how important that is. Um, and I guess when I was younger, I didn't, it wasn't that important, it was more about learning your craft and learning your domain. Um, and as you move on in, in life, you realize that uh, the communication and absolutely the selling skill uh, becomes quite critical. Um, but there are other options. And um, Adrian, from your perspective, when you look at the industry side and you look at organizations that are that are looking at employment and, and employing skills. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an agreement across the board. That's certainly what I'm seeing, is that there is a, a lack of, of digital skill. Um, and yet, when you look at it, you know, um, there are a lot of institutions that are that are developing so-called skills. You've got uh, the universities on the one hand, and then right at the other end of the spectrum, you've got uh, small companies that are also delivering um, skills and courses and training of various sorts. Um, what are you seeing when it comes to um, filling these roles that clearly are out there, the demand is there, you know, how do we address this problem when the universities can only generate so many skills and there's a, there's a, a, 
pent up demand for additional skills? That is um, such a broad question that I'm not sure I've got time to answer it in the remaining period of this session. But um, let me start with um, the view of the pipeline of, of skills development um, and the perception of that pipeline from the employer's perspective. And it's a challenge that we, we've faced um, for all the period of time that I've been uh, sort of engaged in, in looking at this scenario. Um, the information that comes through the, the, the skills um, environment is that, um, you know, we have this perennial skills shortage um, and that we are forever seeking ways of, of closing the gap. Um, and employers report that they have X number of hard to fill vacancies to use the, the terminology of the sector education and training authorities. Um, but if you, if you dig deeper into those and you go to those employers and say, okay, um, you know, what are you doing to um, fill the pipeline to, to make sure that you have candidates coming on board who can um, carry out those, those tasks? Um, too often, what they're looking for is, is a plug and play employee. They want somebody who can uh, come on board and, and straight away be productive and generate uh, revenue for the employer uh, or generate value for the employer. Um, whereas uh, the, the reality is that um, you can't say, um, I'm going to create a, an instant data scientist or a data analyst. You know, those, those um, tasks have to be um, developed over a period of time. You have to learn the basics, which is why I've advocated uh, ever since I started this, that you know, if we don't have a sound schooling system that um, creates a pool of young people who are interested in um, you know, technology and all of the, the facets of it, um, they will not go on to university to study um, those sort of, of subjects. And I hear what uh, Barry says about um, you know, any, uh, any discipline is a good discipline, um, but at the end of the day, um, employers looking for um, people with, with um, technical roles to fill um, are more likely to ask for um, a technical qualification than they are to ask for a softer skills qualification. Um, so that's, that's part of the problem. The other is, um, you know, you can't, um, you can't create skills on an instant basis. Um, it's an investment. So you have to say to yourself as an employer, um, I will invest in skills. I will take those um, graduates from uh, technical universities, from uh, mainstream universities, uh, and I will um, add to their skill set what's needed to make them productive in my environment. Um, it's, it's the old, old story. You know, if you don't um, train people to work in your environment, uh, they'll go off and, and work in somebody else's. Um, so uh, those are the sort of, of issues that um, are, are perennial to this sector. I think they may well be perennial to other sectors, but particularly in, in the, uh, the technology, the digital technology arena. Um, if you don't have that foundation of being able to understand the principles um, then it becomes very difficult for you to um, be curious enough to, to um, develop new solutions to innovate um, because you don't have that foundation. Oh, that's very interesting. What, one thing I just want to lead into, and if I can just uh, ask um, uh, Barry, if you can just check the questions. I know there's, there might be one from Barry that you can uh, respond to in, in a minute. But um, one of the things that we often hear is that um, is this term around job readiness. Um, you find um, students uh, qualifying, coming out of their training, and then not quite being ready for the job. And, and, and I know that um, a number of institutions have got uh, bridging courses that they offer. 
uh, job readiness uh, courses for those people that, that battle to find jobs after being qualified to then go into a three month or six months job readiness program. Um, is that a is is that a uh, is that a general requirement, or is there a need for some of the training institutions to include job readiness into their training programs? Um, Barry, can I ask you to respond to that? Yes. So, um, and it picks up on some of the points that were actually raised by Adrian. I think that uh, you know, there's. Um, um, taking a step slightly back, and we we as universities get a lot of criticism in terms of saying that we aren't preparing our graduates for work. So you employ a, a computer science graduate, three or four years of a degree behind them, and they come and work in your uh, your particular organization. And what we hear companies say is, oh, they're useless. They can't do anything. We have to, to train them. They, they're not ready for work. And I think there are different levels of job readiness. I think that the, the, um, that the uh, soft skills that people need in the workplace are skills that you can't get at university. You need uh, companies to invest in in creating that. And I see um, more and more companies run graduate programs, run internships, where they do do that. They do grow that those, those work readiness skills within the appropriate workplace. I think any of the, and we, we've seen a, a huge growth in these um, coding academies. And um, some of them are excellent. And I think that what they should all be doing is understanding where the people they're training are going to land up and work with those people that, that if they're going to land up in the BPO sector or the financial sector, to work with companies in that sector that are going to employ those people to give them the right work readiness skills as part of the skills academy or the coding academy activities. So I think that uh, you know it's it's a shared responsibility between employers and trainers to get people ready for work. But I think that, that people don't just come out of a, a training program ready on day one to to be productive members of the work mm -hmm. team. I want to, thanks for that, Barry. I want to move over to Barry's question because I do think it's uh, it's something that we can answer right now and then we can move on to the rest. But, but basically, uh, Barry Anser Ferensberg is asking um, to get your thoughts on the role uh, and required level of digital literacy of the C-suite roles uh, on effective digital transformation. Yeah, and can you respond to that, Barry? I do have have a thought. Have lots of thoughts on that. <laughs> I think that that you know what the the C suite in a business is responsible for is all aspects of the business. And as businesses become more digitally focused, those people who run the business need to have, and it's more than um, then a digital literacy. They've got to have a comfort with uh, digital tools, digital technologies, digital applications, the jargon, the buzzwords. So I think that there has to be quite a deep level of understanding of the digital. That's not to say that your chief executive has to go on a Python programming course for a year or that your... Um, 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 CFO has to has to learn about the, the the inner workings of AI, but they should know to 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 be able to ask the right questions and understand what the experts around them are telling them. And more and more um, business schools and universities, I know Vitz is, is very strong in this, and as is Gibbs, are are kind of running these executive 
training courses for um, C-suite um, staff for, for leaders, which is um, kind of preparing them to, to, to manage in the digital world. So I know at the Wits Business School, we've got Professor Brian Armstrong, who runs fantastic programs in digital business. And that's the kind of stuff he covers. So um, uh, yes, Barry, I think that it is very important. And they, they, they have the responsibility to understand digital if they're managing a modern organization. If so I may add some of this, yeah, Adrian. Yeah, just, just if I may add to that, um, and it's from the um, Institute's perspective in, in conjunction with the, the CIO Council, um, we introduced um, a designation for professional CIO. Um, and at the core of that is um, a recognition that um, at, in the C-suite, there must be um, a role for um, somebody who not only leads the technology implementation and support of the business, but understands the strategic importance of that in achieving the enterprise goals. Um, and that's why, um, you know, from our perspective, um, it's not a case, as, as Barry said, of having the, the CEO or the CFO um, become technology uh, competent, but it is a case of having that relationship with peers in the C-suite who can do that for them and to, to assist in bringing the technology to achieve the strategic objectives of the enterprise. Interesting. Um, just in my experience, when you look at um, the digital transformation of organizations, um, you know, to Barry's earlier point, um, this is a lot more intensive and um, transformational uh, than one would think. And um, in many cases, the, the impact of digital transformations means a, a change of operating model, business model, um, and um, impacts across the business from people through to just the way that you look at the, uh, the financials and the, um, the operating model of the organization. Um, so definitely, it might not be that you need to be a programmer, but you definitely need to understand the impact that digital work has on business models. Um, could I, could I just make a quick point on that? Um, yeah. And I think that, that the other important thing is uh, cybersecurity. Okay. And I think that you know, who's responsible for cybersecurity in an organization? It's not the uh, security expert in the basement. It's not the, the, the techies that run the system. It is the C-suite. And we've seen a lot of incidents in the last few years or months even, where, which have been, kept, um, some of them have been kept very quiet, where you, you've had these uh, cyber attacks and ransom where attacks and all sorts of things going on. And I think it is the responsibility of the leadership of the organization to make absolutely certain that their um, cyber security practices are well understood and well instituted and disaster recovery and all of those things. So I think there, there's that responsibility as well. No, I mean, I think just to add to that, I mean, if you look at the impact of social on, um, on companies and the, the rapid impact that uh, a mistake in that area could have, I mean, that's, that's quite significant. And so, so yeah, I think it's, uh, it's making the C-suite a lot more, need to be a lot more agile and a lot more... Um, uh, aware of you know what not only what digital opportunities present, but also what the impact of digital can have from a risk perspective. So yeah, um, I want to quickly move on, and, and I'm going to share my screen again uh, because we don't have that much time left. Because I do want to leave time for more questions, and so if, 
Geez, if there are more questions, we'd be very happy to to look at them. Um, trying to multitask here. Uh, but I'm going to share my screen and then just look at one or two points. The first one is um, just these uh, from the report. This is the list of uh, jobs uh, that that are deemed difficult to respond to so if you look at and adrian i don't know if you want to just talk to this data but i mean this is uh, it's uh, it's talking about um the following is list of hard to fill vacancies um and software developer is right up at the top of this well not quite at the top but together with uh, computer network technicians at the top of this list um, any insights on this briefly before I move on to the next topic? Um, very quickly, this is a, a list drawn from the MICT CETA sector skills plan, um, the last one that we were able to, to access. Um, and whilst it does reflect the number of hard to fill vacancies reported by their um, levy payers, um, the, the issue for us is that it talks about um, jobs here. These are occupations mm -hmm. as listed in the um, organizing framework for occupations. Um, but that doesn't address the actual skills. Um, so in, in our um, comparison with what was reported from the survey respondents, um, we showed a, a list that said, you know, at the top of the list, um, is, is the need for cyber security skills. And if you look at that list of, of vacancies, it would be difficult to see where um, you, know, you, would, you would necessarily uh, fit that in. Um, so um, we, we not only take that information from the MICT CETA, we also look at all of the other sector, sector education and training authorities reports uh, and we extract from there any of them that list um, ICT related occupations as being hard to fill um, so that we can build a picture more broadly than just within the um, ICT employers. Um, but uh, as I say, it, it brings to the fore um, the fact that um, the, the job roles don't necessarily uh, describe the skills. You'll see there is overlap between somebody who is a, a software developer and a programmer. There's overlap between a network and systems engineer and a telecoms network engineer. Um, and we are asking why there has to be those variations on a theme in terms of occupations that actually don't address the skills that are, are required um, to fill those jobs. Okay, all right, thanks for that. And then the next one that I just wanted to just highlight quickly is uh, from this um, view. Yeah. This is basically enterprise skills needs, and I'm assuming this is the data that you got back from the organizations saying this is where we have requirements. Yes. Um, we always ask, um, you know, what, what skills do you have? enough of now what um, do you think you'll have enough of next year and then what skills are you short of now and what skills will you be short of next year um, and the um, interesting parts of this this graph um, are the gray and the blue ones which are um, uh, showing what they're short of now and what they'll be short of next year and in the middle of the chart you'll see um, that blockchain for example they say um, we, we are very low on terms of enough skills now, um, but very high in terms of shortage of skills in um, 2022 and in fact currently. And then similarly in, in artificial intelligence and data science um, arenas, um, the preponderance is that there are serious skill shortages in each of those um, skills areas. And so this would be a good set of data for the um, for the training companies to have a look at and to be aware of that this proverb this is a good indicator of the jobs of the future or the jobs that are going to be uh, in demand in the next couple of years. 
Yes, and by by comparison, um, you'll see, for example, that um, implementation and sh uh, support shows no current or future skills shortage, um, which would indicate that um, uh, that uh, what is it in, in the critical skills um, list that the Department of Home Affairs uses uh, that a desktop support engineer. Um, is not so uh, critical a skill as, as um, we used to think it was back in 2014. Um, and then at the bottom of that chart, um, project management, we seem to have a, a pretty adequate supply of, of project managers, um, uh, just to, to show comparison against the ones where we're desperately short. Sure. Okay. Now the next item that I just briefly want to chat on, um, and this is around reskilling and upskilling, and, and I think the point that I got from the report is that um, uh, when you look at uh, upskilling, um, the idea around lifelong learnership, uh, I think uh, in the report it states if, if, you're, if you're in the ICT sector, then sorry for you, you're going to be studying for the rest of your life because Things are changing so quickly that uh, we are constantly studying. Um, and then on the other hand, um, there's going to be a huge demand for, for upskilling or reskilling, which basically uh, ties into that, you know, as uh, we digitally transform, um, as organizations transform, there's going to be a requirement for, um, for re upskilling and for reskilling. And then certainly to combat the, um, the uh, emergence of automation and, um, and robotic process automation and things of that nature. So, um, Prof Barry, can you just talk into that from your perspective? I know I've said a lot there. But... Sorry, just unmute. So um, I think that uh, it's, it's kind of interesting um, where this this uh, question of reskilling because um, uh, you know the the um, focus is usually on youth on training young people to enter the profession and I think that we've got uh, a, a huge number of people with many years of experience under their belt who need to acquire the new skills so uh, you know. Uh, um, can a person who's a a, um, a, um, a legacy Java developer become a data scientist? Or worse still, if you've got, and I suppose I better not say this because they are in need, but, but what about the old COBOL programmers? You know, can they still have a, um, a future role in this changing industry, in this transforming industry? And I think that we should that this lifelong learning, we, we've, we've got a lot of skills academies that are focusing on bringing new entrants into the, into the profession, but we should also have a big focus on upskilling and reskilling existing people in the industry. And I don't think there's enough of that going on. Uh, it's very hard for someone in, in the, the, the middle of their life, the middle of their working career, to go back to school and learn new things and we should make it easier and encourage it. So I do think there's a big need for that. Adrian, your views on upskilling and reskilling? Um, it's uh, a foundation um, characteristic of professional bodies, not just ours, but uh, across all the spectrum um, that um, Continuing professional development, CPD, is essential to your maintenance of a um, professional recognition. Um, and it's not just for the professional bodies. Um, it's, it applies to everybody in, in work. If you don't keep your, um, keep your eye on the ball, if you don't see how things are changing around you, how the tools that you can use are, are um, being enhanced and so on, then um, you, you very rapidly become a, a dinosaur in, in your occupation. Um, so uh, whether we choose to call it, you know, reskilling or upskilling, 
um, it's, it's something that should drive all of us as, as practitioners to maintain our, um, not just our currency, but our future value um, in terms of uh, employers or, or clients uh, as is appropriate. Well, it's very interesting. I think, um, you know, this is just something that um, has been debated, which is the, the emergence of um, automation and um, automatic processes and sort of the, the question of, you know, is that going to take my job? Is that going to displace me? And I think in some cases, it's definitely true. There will be jobs that will disappear and will be taken over by automated processes. But I do think it presents a huge opportunity for people to reskill themselves, to be proactive and to put themselves in a position where they can um, uh, displace themselves from where they are at risk and put themselves into positions of, uh, you know, of opportunity. Easier said than done, but uh, I, I guess that's the challenge that we all have. We have a few minutes, and so what I want to just ask is, um, Adrian, if you can just give us some closing comments from your side and then uh, hand over to Barry. Um, thanks, Neville. The survey, um, as I said earlier, um, really shows the, the, I'm going to say the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The, the skills shortage is um, a perennial feature of the ICT sector, not just here, but um, globally. Um, and the pandemic has had an effect on the mobility of skills, um, perhaps leading to greater opportunities for um, those of us who are uh, held within a, a territorial boundary for some reason to provide our services electronically to clients elsewhere on the globe. Um, and at the same time, demonstrated to us that um, we can adapt using the tools that are available to us um, to, to new working circumstances. Um, whether or not the numbers that are um, bandied about in terms of, of skill shortage, the number of people who are employed in the various sectors and so on, um, are accurate is, is a time for a, another discussion elsewhere. Um, but the fact is that South Africa needs probably double the number of people it currently has working in these sort of digital roles that we're talking about. Um, and we have a limited time frame in which to uh, develop those, those skills to fill those gaps. Thanks for that, Adrian. Um, Barry, will you just close out? I know the report is huge there. We could have spent many, many hours on, you know, on the topics, but uh, if you can just wrap up and uh, yeah. from your side. Um, so I would encourage people to spend some time reading the report. A lot of thought went into it, and it's, it's a, a valuable resource that I'd encourage people to get hold of. It's free and, and available on all of our websites and easy to get. Uh, but I would um, like to just maybe end with, with an upbeat point. And the, the point is when I formed um, JCSC in 2005, my big ambition was to put South Africa on the map as the go-to place for people that wanted to bring their digital work to South Africa. And the South African IT industry is one of our best kept secrets. It's such an amazingly creative and energetic and special industry of really great people. And I think we could be bringing in huge amounts of work as, the, the, um, as has been proven by the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, BPO sector, um, and South Africans are good at what, what we do. Uh, we, we, we can engage internationally well. And I think we should really look at this uh, digital economy, at this digital sector, to grow the amount of work that comes into South Africa and the role that we play in the world. And I think that it needs us all to pull together. We need to grow the skills. 
we need to work together and make it attractive. But I think we can do it and we could could really make this the, the shining light in the future of South Africa and Africa. So I'd really encourage everyone to take a positive view on this industry and how we can grow it. Yeah, amazing. So on that amazing positive note, I just want to thank both you, Barry and uh, Adrian, for you participating with me in this webinar. Um, it's been it's been a pleasure. Um, we basically just touched on a few items from the report. So can I just reiterate and just say, please get the report, keep it, uh, read it, and look into it because there's extremely valuable information in it. And um, so with that, I would like to thank everyone that attended. Um, if you are listening to this recording, uh, thank you for downloading it and listening to it. And then we'll see you in the next Digital Insights, which hopefully will be next month. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.